Okay, if everybody could please take their seats. We're going to get going um, on our next second piece of the program. Thank you. Uh, a few little housekeeping things. There will be a break. I believe it's at 1 o'clock. Is that right, Jorinda? Yeah, at 1 o'clock there's going to be um, a break just so you can time your intake of food and drink uh, throughout the day. Um, in the afternoon we have more presentations including um, Paul Preciado's contribution will be by Skype. Um, and we're going to keep staging conversations um, as we go. Uh, by the end of the day, we're going to move into the nonverbal uh, portion of our program, and uh, Boy Child is going to do a sort of conversation slash performance um, that proceeds very often without words. Uh, so I just I wanted to mention the trajectory. We're going to like keep moving further and further away from uh, uh, actual. Uh, physical language, or we're going to move towards physical language. So, to um, um, for the next speaker, it, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Karen Barad, who I mentioned uh, in the introduction earlier, and with whom I've just spent a few days in New York, where they were speaking um, at Columbia University to a packed house, um, and providing people with this incredible bridge that they're able to build between conversations that are ongoing in the humanities um, and speculations that proceed under the heading of quantum physics. And there are literally so few people who are able to do what Barad does um, that this conversation is necessarily singular. And uh, therefore, I'm, I'm thrilled that we're going to get another chapter of the haptic through the mechanism of quantum field theory. Karen Barad is Professor of Feminist Studies, Philosophy, and History of Consciousness at the University of California, Santa Cruz. They received a PhD in Theoretical Particle Physics from SUNY Stony Brook and began their academic career in a physics department, um, I think at Barnard, as a matter of fact, we found out the other day. Uh, their research interests are broad-ranging and include feminist science studies, materialisms, deconstruction, post-structuralism, critical post-humanism, post-colonial studies, multi-species studies, science and justice, justice, physics, continental philosophy, epistemology, queer and trans theories. There's almost no conversation we're going to have today that we could not bring uh, um, Karen into. They are the author of a path-breaking book, Meeting the Universe Halfway, Quantum Physics and the Entanglement of Matter and Meaning. Barad is a unique thinker capable of code switching back and forth between physics and feminism, the haptic and the quantum. Uh, they <laughs> offer bewilderment um, illuminated by flashes of pure brilliance. Please welcome Karen Barad. Ah, good morning, or afternoon, or evening, or whatever time it is. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Jack, um, both for your wonderful introduction this morning and for inviting me and for being a wonderful host friend the past few days. And um, thank you also for all the organizers and everybody who I'm sure doesn't get named who helped make this happen. I also really cannot proceed without thanking Rizvana and the amazing uh, set of talks that happened yesterday. And I also want to thank in advance um, all of my partners in crime who will be talking today, because I'm sure they will have been amazing as well, um, talks and, and not talks. Um, in order to proceed today, I need to give you a little bit of a backdrop against which to understand what I'm talking about this morning. And that has to do with the fact that my project currently comes out of my research in physics, which is called quantum field theory. I've been mostly talking about quantum mechanics, which uh, quantum field theory is a much more comprehensive theory. And if quantum mechanics is about this strange, Quantum field theory is up in the stratosphere somewhere. So, um, and it's an important project. It's a very, very important project, especially from the point of view of questions 
um, not only of philosophical openings, but also of questions of justice that are absolutely central to this um, endeavor, which has to do with the fact that I've tried to interrupt a, a narrative that gets told among physicists about the fact that quantum field theory uh, started being developed in the um, early, late 20s and throughout the 30s, and then was quote unquote interrupted by the war effort where um, the same physicists who were working on developing quantum field theory were called in to develop something very different, which is the atomic bomb. Uh, and then afterwards, they continued working on quantum field theory. And my project has been to examine not only the continuities of, that, um, of those uh, seemingly disparate projects, um, but also to get inside the belly of the beast, as it were, uh, a place of militarism, colonialism, racism, and to show that within that very same theory are these incredible ways in which it deconstructs itself, and to show that uh, there are these um, radical new imaginaries, these new old imaginaries, because one of the things that quantum field theory really does is trouble not only a linear chronology, but even a notion of temporality where we'd have anything like uh, one time at a time. And so, um, so always the new old, which is how I feel about um, materialisms as well. So, um, so I just wanted to say that continuing with the themes of yesterday, not disrupting it, are questions of violence and erotics in a kind of strange topology of being inside, each inside the other. And also talking about different structures of nothingness. Um, which, as you'll see, is a, another important theme that comes through the quantum field theory. When two hands touch, there is a sensuality of the flesh, an exchange of warmth, a feeling of pressure, of presence, a proximity of otherness that brings the other nearly as close as oneself perhaps closer. And if the two hands belong to one person, might this not enliven an uncanny sense of the otherness of self, a literal holding oneself at a distance in the sensation of contact, the greeting of the stranger within? So much happens in a touch, an infinity of others, other beings, other spaces, other times are aroused. When two hands touch, how close are they? What is the measure of closeness? Which disciplinary knowledge formations, political parties, religious and cultural traditions, infectious disease authorities, immigration officials, and policy makers do not have a stake in, if not a measured answer to this question? When touch is at issue, Nearly everyone's hair stands on end. I can barely touch on even a few aspects of touch here, at most offering the barest suggestion of what it might mean to approach, to dare to come into contact with this infinite finitude. Many voices speak here in the interstices, a cacophony of always already reiteratively intra-acting stories. These are entangled tales. Each is diffractively threaded through and <coughs> enfolded in the other. Is that not in the nature of touching? Is touching not by its very nature always already an involution, invitation, invisitation, wanted or unwanted of the stranger within? This next part of the paper is called Electric Fields and Yearnings, Attraction and Repulsion touching on touch. Touch, for a physicist, is but an electromagnetic interaction. Oh, no. OK. Hold on one second here. I seem to be at the end, not the beginning, which is totally perfect. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. 
touch for a physicist is but an electromagnetic interaction. A common explanation for the physics of touch is that one thing it does not involve is, well, touching. <laughs> that is, there is no actual contact involved. You may think you are touching a coffee mug or uh, when you're about to raise it to your mouth, but your hand is not actually touching the mug. Sure, you can feel the smooth surface of the mug's exterior right where your fingers come into contact with it or seem to. But what you are actually sensing is the electromagnetic repulsion between the electrons of the atoms that make up your fingers and those that make up the mug. Electrons are tiny negatively charged particles that surround the nuclei of atoms and having the same charges, they repel one another, much like powerful little magnets. As you decrease the distance between them, the repulsive force increases. Try as you might, you cannot bring two electrons into direct contact with each other. The reason the desk feels solid or the cat's coat feels soft or we can even hold coffee cups in one another's hands is an effect of electromagnetic repulsion. All we ever really feel is the electromagnetic force not the other whose touch we seek. Atoms are mostly empty space, and electrons, which lie at the farthest reaches of the atom, hinting at its perimeter, cannot bear direct contact. Electromagnetic repulsion, negatively charged particles communicating at a distance, push each other away. That is the tale physics usually tells about touching. Repulsion at the core of attraction. See how, far, see how far that story gets you with lovers. No wonder the romantic poets had had enough. The quantum theory of touching is radically different from this classical explanation. Actually, it is radically queer, as we shall see. This next section of the paper is called Quantum Field Theory, a Virtual Introduction. <coughs> Quantum field theory allows for something radically new in the history of Western physics, the transience of matter's existence. No longer suspended in eternity, matter is born, lives, and dies. But even more than that, there is a radical deconstruction of identity and the equation of matter with essence in ways that transcend even the profound undoing of non-relativistic quantum mechanics. By the way, um, I have uh, several slashes in this paper, and I try to mention the fact that I, instead of saying unslash doing, which I think really interrupts the text, I will try to pronounce it undoing, or something like this. And what I mean by that is not just an and, or, or even an or. Uh, but it has to do with uh, a quantum superposition, which has to do with this cutting together a part of the terms. So, um, so I'll be doing some of that here. So I'll just read that sentence again and keep going. But even more than that, there is a radical deconstruction of identity and of the equation of matter with essence in ways that transcend even the profound undoings of non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Quantum field theory is a call, an alluring murmur of the insensible within the sensible to radically rework the nature of being and time. The insights of quantum field theory are crucial, but the philosophical terrain is rugged, <clears throat> slippery, and mostly unexplored. The question is how to proceed with exquisite care. We will need to be in and of the science, no easy way around it. Unfortunately, in the limited space I have here, I can only lightly touch, really just barely gaze the graze the surface. Quantum field theory differs from classical physics not only in its formalism, but in its ontology. Classical physics inherits a Democritan ontology, only particles and the void, well, with one additional element, fields. Particles, fields, and the void are three separate elements in classical physics, where the, whereas they are intra-related elements in quantum field theory. To take one instance, according to quantum field theory, particles are quanta of the fields. 
For example, the quantum of the electromagnetic field is a photon. The quantum of the gravitational field is a graviton. Electrons are quanta of the electron field, and so on. Another feature is that the void is far from vacuous, and something very profound happens to the relationship between particles and void. I will continue to explain how this relationship is radically rethought in what follows. For now, I simply note, pace democritus, that particles no longer take their place in the void. Rather, they are constitutively entangled with it. Let's begin with the question of the void. Nothingness. The absence of matter. The blank page. Utter silence. No thing, no thought, no awareness. Complete ontological insensibility. Shall we utter some words about nothingness? What is there to say? How to begin? How can anything be said about nothing without violating its very nature, perhaps even its conditions of possibility? Isn't any utterance about nothingness always already a performative breach of that which one means to address? Have we not already said too much simply in pronouncing its name? Classically speaking, the void is that which is devoid of matter, that which literally doesn't matter. When it comes to the quantum vacuum, as with all quantum phenomena, ontological indeterminacy, not epistemological uncertainty, but ontological indeterminacy, is at the heart of the matter and no matter. Indeed, is it not rather the very exist nature of existence that is at issue, or rather non-existence, or rather the conditions of impossibility for non-existence? Or maybe that's the very question the vacuum keeps asking itself. Maybe the ongoing questioning of itself is what generates, or rather is, the structure of nothingness. The vacuum is no doubt doing its own experiments with non-being. Indeterminacy is not the state of a thing, but an unending <coughs> dynamism. The play of indeterminacy accounts for the undoings of no-thingness. From the point of view of classical physics, the vacuum has no matter and no energy, but the quantum principle of ontological indeterminacy calls the existence of such a zero energy, zero matter state into question, or rather makes it into a question with no decidable answer. Not a settled matter, or rather no matter. And if the energy of the vacuum is not determinately zero, it isn't determinately empty. In fact, this indeterminacy is responsible not only for the void not being nothing, while not being something, but it may, in fact, be the source of all that is, a womb that births existence. Birth and death are not the sole prerogative of the animate world. Quote, unquote, inanimate beings also have finite lives. Quote, <clears throat> particles can be born and particles can die, explains one physicist. In fact, it is a matter of birth, life, and death that requires the development of a new subject in physics, that of quantum field theory. Quantum field theory is a response to the ephemeral nature of life, unquote. According to quantum field theory, the vacuum can't be determinately nothing, because the indeterminacy principle allows for fluctuations of the quantum vacuum. How might we understand vacuum fluctuations? Let's consider a very simple example of a field, an infinite drum head. If the drum head is not vibrating, then it's completely flat and has the same value everywhere. Let's call this the zero value, corresponding to no displacement. If a drummer now taps the drum head, it vibrates, and waves of energy flow outwards from where it is tapped. Thus far, we have a classical field theory with a perfectly still drum head representing the classical vacuum or zero energy state 
and a vibrating drumhead representing a non-zero energy state. Now we add quantum physics. Quantizing the field means that only certain discrete vibrational states exist. If you're not used to thinking about different vibrational modes of a drum, it may be easier to visualize a stringed instrument with only a discrete set of standing waves or harmonics possible. So now we add special relativity, in particular the insight that matter and energy are equivalent. E equals mc squared, my only equation in the talk. <laughs> Since the vibrations of the field carry energy and only a discrete set of energy states can exist, a mass value can be assigned to each energy state. Then we can see that a field vibrating at a particular frequency or energy is, equi is equivalent to the existence of particles of matter with a particular mass. This correspondence between quantum particles and quantized fields is the cornerstone of quantum field theory. Now let's return to our question. What is a vacuum fluctuation? Using the drum example, the quantum vacuum would correspond to a state where the average value of the displacements is zero everywhere. That is, there's no drummer tapping the drum. And yet the stillness of the drum head is not assured, or rather, there is no determinate fact of the matter as to whether or not the drum head is perfectly still, even in the absence of an external disturbance, including drumming. The vacuum is a speaking silence, a quiet cacophony of different frequencies, pitches, tempos, melodies, noises, pentatonic scales, cries, blasts, sirens, sighs, syncopations, quarter tones, allegro, allegros, ragas, bebops, hip hops, whimpers, whines, screams are threaded through the silence, ready to erupt, but simultaneously cross-cut by a disruption dissipating, dispersing the would-be sound into non-being, an indeterminate symphony of voices. And I'd love it if we could talk about different structures of nothingness, and I think that we saw many interesting examples yesterday of nothingness and the different expressions and the different ways in, with, in which nothingness speaks, doesn't speak itself. In other words, vacuum fluctuations are the indeterminate vibrations of the vacuum or zero energy state. So putting this point in the complementary language of particles rather than fields, we can understand vacuum fluctuations in terms of the existence of virtual particles. Virtual particles are quanta of vacuum fluctuations. That is, virtual particles are quantized indeterminacies in action. Now, um, this all may seem to be um, rather abstract at this point, but I assure you that the um, implications are um, really very concrete, uh, very material. But also, one of the things I forgot to tell you in my introductory remarks is I'm about to engage with some quantum field theory. One of the key players in this story about quantum field theory is Richard Feynman, a Nobel prize winner, and it's important that you know that um, Richard Feynman not only won the Nobel Prize in physics for handling the so-called infinities problem of quantum field theory for his contributions, but also that Richard Feynman was very instrumental in helping to build the atomic bomb, and John von Neumann, a mathematician working on that project, Richard Feynman said he gave him permission to be, have fun and be wholly irresponsible in putting that together. So that's another piece of the backdrop against which to hear some of this today. Okay, so back to the vacuum. The vacuum is an animate dynamism of the indeterminacy of non-being. It is a no-thingness, neither nothing nor something. The vacuum is a vigorous exploration of virtuality, where virtual particles whose identifying characteristic is indeterminacy are having a field day performing experiments in being in time. That is, virtuality is a kind of thought experiment the world performs. Virtual particles do not traffic in a metaphysics of presence. They do not exist in space and time. 
They are ghostly non-existences that teeter on the edge of the infinitely fine blade between being and non-being. Admittedly, virtuality is difficult to grasp. Indeed, this is its very nature. This next uh, section of the paper is called Quantum Field Theory, a Touchy Subject. When it comes to quantum field theory, it is not difficult to find trouble. Epistemological trouble, ontological trouble, a troubling of kinds, of identities, of the nature of touching and self-touching, of being and time, to name a few. It is not so much that trouble is around every corner. According to quantum field theory, it inhabits us and we inhabit it. Or rather, trouble inhabits everything and nothing matter and the void. How does quantum field theory understand the nature of matter? Let us start with the electron, one of the simplest particles, a point particle, a particle entirely devoid of structure. Even the simplest bit of matter causes all kinds of difficulties for quantum field theory. For as a result of time being indeterminacy, the electron does not exist as an isolated particle, but is always already inseparable from the wild activities of the vacuum. In other words, the electron is always already interacting with the virtual particles of the vacuum in all possible ways. For example, the electron will emit a virtual photon, the sec that's the second line down there, will emit a virtual photon and then reabsorb it. This possibility is understood as the electron electromagnetically interacting with itself. Part of what an electron is, is its self-energy interaction. But the self-energy interaction is not a process that happens in isolation either. All kinds of more involved things can and do occur in this frothy virtual soup of indeterminacy that we ironically think of as a state of pure emptiness. For example, in addition to the electron exchanging a virtual photon with itself, that is touching itself, it is possible that the virtual, for the virtual photon to enjoy other interactions with itself. For example, the virtual photon can metamorphize or transition, change its very identity. It can transform into a virtual electron-positron pair, for example, that subsequently annihilate each other and morph back into a single virtual particle before it is reabsorbed by the electron. A positron, by the way, is an anti-electron. It has the same charge as an electron. Uh, this, I'm sorry, the same mass, the opposite charge, and goes backwards in time. So anyway, there are many things that can happen that's signified by the diagrams in the lower line of that, and my, many, many more. In fact, that many, many more is a shorthand for an infinite set of possibilities involving every possible kind of interaction with every possible kind of virtual particle it can interact with. That is, there is a virtual exploration of every possibility, and this infinite set of possibilities, or infinite sum of histories, entails a particle touching itself and the particle that transforms the touch transforming itself and then that touching touching itself and transforming and touching other particles that make up the vacuum and so on ad infinitum. Not everything is possible given a particular interaction, but an infinite number of possibilities exists. Every level of touch then is itself touched by all possible others. Particle self-interactions entail particle transitions from one kind to another in a radical undoing of kinds, queer transformations. Hence, self-touching is an encounter with the infinite alterity of the self. Matter is an infolding or involution. It cannot help touching itself and in this self-touching, it comes into contact with the infinite alterity that it is. Polymorphous perversity raised to an infinite power. Talk about queer trans intimacy. What is being called into question here is the very nature of self. And in terms not just of being, but of time. 
There is an important sense that the self is dispersed or diffracted through time and being. Commenting specifically on the electron's self-energy interaction, the physicist Richard Feynman, who won a Nobel Prize for his contributions to developing quantum field theory, expressed horror at the electron's monstrous nature and its perverse ways of engaging with the world. <laughs> Quote, instead of going directly from one point to another, the electron goes along for a while and suddenly emits a photon and then horrors. It absorbs its own photon. <laughs> Perhaps there's something immoral about that. <laughs> but the electron does it. This self-energy, such self-touching term has been labeled a perversion of the theory because the calculation of the self-energy contribution is infinite, which is an unacceptable answer to any question about the nature of the electron, such as what is its mass or charge. Apparently touching oneself or being touched by oneself, the ambiguity, undecidability, indeterminacy may itself be the key to the trouble, is not simply troubling, but a moral violation, the very source of all the trouble. I think this goes to the question that Jack was talking to us about in the beginning, about not making the wrong right, but an undoing of the normativity um, that makes those terms, le those terms legible. So the problem of self-touching, especially self-touching the other, is a perversity of quantum field theory that goes far deeper than we can touch on here. The gist of it is this. This perversity that is at the root of an unwanted infinity that threatens the very possibility of calculability gets re-normalized, obviously. <laughs> right? We wouldn't expect anything less. This is technical term, it's renormalization. <laughs> so how does this happen, this renormalization? So physicists conjectured that there are two different kinds of infinities or perversities involved in this case. One that has to do with self-touching and another that has to do with nakedness. That is, in addition to the infinity related to self-touching, there is an affinity, infinity associated with the quote unquote bare point particle. This is a technical term, the bare point particle. Um, that is with the metaphysical assumption we started with that there is only an electron, the undressed electron, okay? The undressed bare electron and the void as being separate from one another. So renormalization is the systematic cancellation of infinities an intervention based on the idea that the subtraction of different size infinities, for example, uh, can be a finite quantity. Perversion, eliminating perversion. The cancellation idea is this. The infinity of the bare point particle cancels the infinity associated with the cloud of virtual particles. And in this way, the bare point particle is dressed by the vacuum con uh, contributions, that is, by the cloud of virtual particles. The dressed electron, the electron in drag, that is, the physical electron, is thereby renormalized, that is, made normal or finite. So um, again, I'm using technical language throughout here. <laughs> There's all kinds of mathematics behind this, but that's what you need to know. <laughs> So renormalization is the mathematical handling or taming of these infinities. That is, the infinities are subtracted from one another, yielding a finite answer. Mathematically speaking, this is a tour de force. Conceptually, it is a queer theorist's delight. It shows that all of matter, matter in its essence, of course, that's precisely what's being troubled here, is a massive overlaying of perversities, an infinity of infinities. To summarize, quantum field theory radically deconstructs the ontology of classical physics. The starting point ontology of particles in the void, a foundational reductionist essentialism, is undone by quantum field theory. According to quantum field theory, perversity and monstrosity lie at the core of being, or rather it is threaded through it. All touching, 
entails an infinite alterity, so that touching the other is touching all others, including the self. And touching the self entails touching the stranger within. Even the smallest bits of matter are an unfathomable multitude. Each individual always already includes all possible interactions with itself through all possible virtual others, including those in itself that are non-contemporaneous with itself. That is, every finite being is always already threaded through with an infinite alterity diffracted through being and time. Indeterminacy is an undoing of identity that unsettles the very foundations of non-being. Electrons, for example, are inherently chimeras, cross-species, cross-kind mixtures, made of virtual configurations, reconfigurings of disparate kinds of being dispersed across space and time, in an undoing of kind, being, becoming, absence, presence, here, now, I'm sorry, here, there, now, then. So much for natural essence. The electron, a point particle without structure, is a patchwork of kinds sutured together in uncanny configurations, trying out new appendages made of various particle-antiparticle pairs, producing and absorbing differences of every possible kind in a radical undoing of kind as essential difference. Its identity is the undoing of identity. Its very nature is unnatural, not given, not fixed, but forever transitioning and transforming itself. Electrons rebirth themselves in their engagement with all others, not as an act of self-birthing, but in an ongoing recreating that is an undoing of self. Electrons are always already untimely, it is not that electrons sometimes engage in such perverse explorations. These experiments in interactive transmaterial performativity are what an electron is. Ontological indeterminacy, a radical openness, an infinity of possibilities is at the core of mattering. How strange that indeterminacy and its infinite openness is the condition for the possibility of all structures in their dynamic reconfiguring stabilities and instabilities. Matter in its iterative materialization is a dynamic play of indeterminacy. Matter is never a settled matter. It is always already radically open. Closure cannot be secured when the conditions of impossibilities and lived indeterminacies are integral, not supplementary to what matter is. In an important sense, in a breath breathtakingly intimate sense, touching, sensing is what matter does, or rather what matter is. Matter is condensations of responses, of response ability. Thank you. I can't even decide how to resolve the indeterminacy of where to sit. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what happens when you invite a physicist to uh, a conference on touching. We find out that touching is not touching. Uh, we were operating under some sort of illusion all along. Um, so thank you, uh, uh, Karen. I, I, I just want to put a couple of themes into play, and then I'm hoping that people will we want to pick up on those and um, um, we can elaborate together because it seems to me that um, one theme could be about this relationship between the animate and the inanimate, which is going to come up later in uh, relationship to Mel Chen's work. We're so sure we know about these relations, but when we come down to the electron, the level of the electron and the ion, 
uh, animation and inanimacy are really, really different. So that might be one area. The other, um, of course, is the vacuum. Um, and I, I wonder how people would like to use this insight that a vacuum is not the absence of something, but is the fullness of, I guess, competing indeterminacies is one way of putting it. And I wonder how we can put into play this understanding um, of the vacuum. And I heard you do it the other day in a way that does sort of comply with what Erin was talking about earlier in relationship to the compulsion to be political, but was incredibly effective in that Karen gave a wide-ranging talk about the difference between the Trinity site where uh, bomb testing uh, was carried out in the context of the US and the sites of the bombing in Hiroshima. Um, in the aftermath of the dropping of the atomic bomb, you don't have nothing, even though the obliteration suggests nothing. You have comparative nothingness, sites of nothingness that are toxic to the people who are living in an atmosphere that seems to not have anything in it. So you gave us those great examples, and I think those could be um, useful to think with, and people might have examples of art, as uh, Julia did earlier, that, that would be useful here. Um, and then finally, the vibration. I mean, that, that example of the drum was, was so incredible. And we are going to talk about agitation in a while. And I wondered if we could start thinking about the vibratory, um, which is both a musical uh, metaphor. Um, it, it's, it is also a direct consequence of touch. Um, and it is a mode of communication that we're maybe not very good at deciphering. Um, so what would it mean to think and to speak and to communicate in a vibratory uh, medium rather than in this rather what seems now like a very clumsy medium of language? So I know, Karen, that for you, these things are not metaphors. And you, you've made that really clear. But is there a way to unpack some of these contributions not necessarily practically, because that why, but maybe aesthetically, if we can mm. use some of the material that you've given us to unpack uh, an aesthetics of the haptic. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Jack. Um, yeah, one of the things that's very um, important to me about what's coming out of the quantum field theory are the different structures of nothingness. Um, you know, um, d there are very, very different kinds of um, silent speech, or however we want to say, of what's happening uh, within different kinds of voids. And, you know, I'm thinking here of um, the work, for example, of Norbesi Phillips' uh, Zong, um, you know, this incredibly powerful piece of work that I have the privilege of watching being performed at UCSC. Um, wh where uh, basically uh, the, it has to do with the slave ship song and, the, and a legal case, uh, which was the only evidence uh, left over for the fact that um, Africans who were stolen from their land, who were kidnapped, were thrown overboard as cargo in order to collect insurance monies. And the question of how to tell a story that can't be told is what she keeps reiterating throughout um, her discussion of the poem, of the series of poems. And, uh, and one of the things there is, you know, how, how can, you know, what, what words are coming up uh, through the liquid uh, geographies, uh, just to bring in some of the discussion yesterday. Um, so how do we hear different, different kinds of voids? And then the colonial entanglements between Hiroshima and uh, Trinity site. Uh, to understand that these voids have layers and layers of colonialism, militarism, and all kinds of other things that are sedimented into them. And what I wanted to talk about today in terms of touching also, um, not as a separate conversation, but as part of that ongoing conversation, is the ways in which a matter itself becomes a source of trouble for the physicists who are uh, have come upon the fact for the first time in a thousand years of, of Western thinking about matter, uh, this you know brand new discovery, right? the new the new old always, this brand new discovery that that matter uh, is finite in its lifetime, and shortly after that it's blown to smithereens, and it's created all of these perversions. Um, 
uh, for the theorists who are trying to negotiate this territory. So I wanted to unleash some of that uh, for our you know, political thinking about what other kinds of possibilities there are. And I find it very interesting, and I think you know, it's not so much that I'm trying at all to offer a correction about saying this is what touching really is, but this is the way that we have been talking about touching. The, it's kind of like the electron has a um, psyche Right? I mean, the, the other is already within, and when I'm touching myself, or when I'm feeling attraction on other kinds of desire, there's repulsion inside it. And all of these kinds of things that uh, we talk about as solely human. And so that's what I think is also uh, very important in all of this, is a kind of undoing of the human, if we think about the human capital H, the way Sylvia Winter uses it. Um, you know, that kind of... Um, uh, clear undoing and all of its troubling here, but all of its richness brings forward other possibilities. Mm. So we have about 10 minutes. Yes, we, we definitely have uh, comments. Uh, we'll take uh, again, we'll start with Rizvana and then we'll go all the way back and if anyone over this side, if we're missing you, we'll come over. Uh, we'll take a few comments. Thank you, Rizvana. Hi, hi, okay, thank you. Um, thank you for that great presentation. Um, it really um, made me think a lot about some of the conversations we were having yesterday. Uh, particularly, I'm brought back to Lichia Lewis's um, citation of Fred Moten's Blackness and Nothingness. And so part of what I'm thinking about is precisely what you just said, right? Um, your sort of formulation that voids are, there are many layers, right, to this thing called the void, that the void is not a kind of universal formation or composition. Um, and I really enjoyed that you um, referenced Norbesi Phillips' song. One of the things I'm thinking about is the way in which somebody like, um, thinking about the, way, the ways in which voids might be thought of as um, sites for multiplicity and the making of a kind of dense sociality, right? That a actually something is being composed in this thing called the void. Yes. And so somebody who I, I, I feel has theorized this in a, in a sort of elaborate and beautiful poetic way is Edouard Glissant, right? Mm -hmm. When he's talking about the abyssal, yes. right, formation, right, the, 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 the lives lost in the abyss. Um, and so I, I, you know, all that is to say, I'm wondering if there's a way to um, create a kind of relay between your uh, assertion that quantum, which I don't know much about, admittedly, but um, quantum, quantum field theory is radically queer, can we also say quantum field theory is radically black, yes. possibly, Yes. as well? Yes, thanks, thanks for, the, for the question, Rizvana. And yes, ab absolutely, I think the vacuum is racialized and, and is uh, both about <coughs> violence and also resource. And uh, I just had the pleasure of being in New York a month ago talking with Fred about um, nothingness. And um, yeah, I think that the, the reason why, one of the reasons why I'm speaking of queerness here has to do with a very particular context and a particular anxiety on the part of the physicists. Um, and that's why I wanted to go there. But that is not to say that the only um, resource that's available or to put it into conversation with or to draw from these other resources and bring them in conversation in my own discussions of trying to bring forward what the void is and what it holds and, and so on and so forth. That's, you know, there are so many different, I've, I've started writing some of these different things and it's, it's a very, very large, um, it's a very large project, but the specificity of the anxiety of Richard Feynman is why I go to queerness in particular, which is not to exclude questions of race, but just to start breaking open how incredibly um, much whatever is scaring him and all the other physicists is very much alive in what's been created and broken open. So, thank you. I think my question kind of follows on for Rosanna's as well, because I saw a talk that you did with um, uh, Denise. Uh, yeah. And what struck me about it was a logic that actually was employed, to, which was the first time I saw anyone take the tools of the master to deconstruct the house of the master. And here I wonder with you, Karen, um, 
how the how do we not think about an enlightenment or how do we undo the enlightenment project of displacing God and magic and especially maybe midwifery in the imagination of population and how um, that maybe speaks to like a hunger of certain people for the anti-social scale but more I mean like the, the pre-social or as well as the non-social. Okay. So you'll answer that. There's also Hortense uh, has a question. Do you want to take a stab at that or take another? I'll take another yep. uh, comment. Sure. Thank you very much, Karen, for that uh, really quite astonishing talk. And I wanted to ask you, uh, what are the implications biographically hmm. for physicists um, in light of... Uh, quantum field theory and, and your reading today, what, 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 what happens? I mean, it seems to me that um, if, if, if your reading is plausible, and I'm, I'm entirely convinced by it, that this is going to change uh, the way we configure in our imagination uh, the sciences, and that's going to have an impact on what we're doing in the humanity. So that it's a really radical talk, it seems to me, that, that you're giving. So I want to know, what, uh, what do the physicists think when you say such things to them? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can talk about that at lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, how should I say? This, the project that I was doing uh, earlier, well, first of all, let me say, uh, from my own um, experience as a physicist, I've spent half my career in physics and half in the humanities now, and um, uh, I was obsessed with these questions of how do how can I be responsible to that which I love was my question to myself while I was doing activist work, living a schizophrenic existence of doing activist work and being in a physics department. And uh, that has in some ways driven my entire project. How do I answer that at least for myself? Um, and so this is a um, this is actually, uh, you know, little bits and pieces coming forward here. I think that my earlier work is taken up by some very thoughtful physicists in a way that there's an embrace, and I'm not so sure it's going to happen now. Um, both because of the poetics that are involved, because what I find is that I can't just give a linear narrative account like this. Like before when I was doing quantum field theory, I felt like I was holding on to the trunk of a tree and climbing. And the way I've described it to other people is quantum field theory is so strange and ha so little philosophy of quantum field theory has been done that I feel like I'm way out in the really fragile part of the leaves and maybe like an inchworm hanging over the void mm -hmm. trying to describe this. And so poetics has been for me the only way I can get to rigor as best I can in trying to speak the equations as I understand them happening. So I think because of the loud and clear ways in which the politics is coming through and because of the poetics, I think this is gonna have a different reception. But this has been my, this is going home for me. And finally, you know, this is making a full circle in a sense, in my career, now that I'm sitting here with gray hair, um, being able to say some of, speak some of the question back to myself, at the very least. So. Do you want to try the, the question that I think was about a kind of what does this do to our sense of history? It was very sp Scale. Scales. Why does what? Why a hunger for certain scales. Scales. What scales? Like, a, like a hunger for certain kinds of scales. I just thought of like Fred. Fred Martin talks about anti with an e, and sometimes just. I know I was thinking about the anti-social yeah. scale. Yeah. yeah. And so then I'm thinking about if if you, I don't know if you imagine Kepler or anyone thinking oh 
there is something beyond this. There is something smaller than. There is ah. something more over that I don't that I don't know over there. Yeah. Inside, and how that every shift for smaller or bigger or larger or whatever. Yeah. And is actually a, talks about a, a desire for something that I. And what is that desire for? Yeah, I, I'm not sure I fully understand your question, but I can come at a few points of it maybe, and then, then we can talk more afterwards if, if we don't have time for you to come back. Um, so first of all, on the question of scale, um, we're talking here about the smallest particles being atmospheric in scale, reaching across the largest reaches of our planet uh, and beyond. Uh, you know, we're talking about the explosion of the nucleus making an atom bomb, reaching, making a bridge, as it were, a literal bridge between heaven and earth. So the whole thing of scale here is um, a question that is undone by the very physics, um, both in terms of the radical undoing of itself, um, as I just mentioned, but also we don't know what scales are, what size is, what distance is, or what time it is. And I think this is also very, very important in all of this. And so this is not about, you know, looking at the very, very small and then saying with all the authority of physics, capital P, that this is the way we ought to think of the social, you know? No, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, um, okay, maybe I'm not getting, I'm probably not getting your question okay, then. It doesn't matter, but I'm just thinking about, before, I'm just thinking about um, anti-social as being as a place where, like, the, as, a, as if we undo all those metaphors of how electrons or particles relate to each other, so that doesn't talk about how we relate to each other, but it, um, but that yet there is a, um, a desire to get to a place where we, where if not for us in this room perhaps, but for others who are studying this. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I, I mean, just let me, let me just make a comment that maybe brings back to us back to what uh, Rizvana was saying in her initial question to me, which is when I think about Leha's uh, film that we saw and a way in which there was this moment, if you, for people who were here yesterday, of the nothingness being expressed and the ways in which there were all possible touchings, both with the nothingness of the space of the black box and with each other. And it's that kind of thing that is not only queer, but is a different kinds of expressions of sociality in their, you know, anti-te-ness. Um, that I think um, you know, that we could uh, make quantum field theory a resource for um, those kinds of uh, discussions as well. Because I think there's, there is that kind of thing happening because there isn't temporality. It's very much tra uh, troubling of time and being. And time itself does not precede, uh, nor does it, yeah, I'm not even sure what I mean by the notion of before and after in this, kind, in this kind of scheme. In fact, it has this strange topology of being inside the other, each inside the other. It's a very strange topology, so yeah. All right, um, I, I think that we, this would be a good place to stop. We've been dropped into a void that is not a void and <laughs> we're looking into the abyss, so that seems like a great time for lunch. Um, I really want to thank Karen um, for bringing this particular conversation.